So if you're new here with us uh, today, what we've been doing over the last couple of weeks is we've been talking about this theme called Let There Be Peace. And uh, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about hope, how we don't hope in hope, we hope in a person, and we hope in a promise that one day we're going to go to heaven, and that heaven, on, in he- the, the kingdom in heaven can actually come and be with us in part now. And then last week, we talked about God's love and how overwhelmingly powerful that love is. That no matter who we are, we are loved and loved unconditionally. But today, I want to talk about fear. I want to talk about how the the shepherds were afraid. And we've been using this song and the lyrics in this song called Let There Be Peace, Glory, as kind of a jumping off point. And we've been singing it every week. And I hope that it's been catchy to you because I find myself whistling that song almost all the time around the house and at the office. Uh, But it spoke to me and it became part of the reason why we went down this road with these series of messages. One of the lines in the song is like this, do not be afraid. His love is strong enough to save us. Nothing can stand in the way of his love. It is strong enough to lead us. So sing glory, glory, let there be peace, and let it start in me. It's the the story of the angel who showed up with the shepherds. Do not be afraid, he says to them. I want to talk to you about fear today because I think that you and I can identify with the shepherds in this story because the Bible tells us that they were terrified. And there is a sense in which every one of us has fears in our life that we come into church with, that we come to God with, and we need to understand who God is so that we can deal with some of these fears in us. To make matters worse, uh, sometimes we manage to scare our little kids way more than we should. Uh, I don't know if it's, this prayer is still around today, but when I was younger, it was pretty popular. Now I lay me down to sleep. You remember that prayer, right? Unfortunately, it has a really awful part in it, right? I mean, can you imagine a four-year-old? Let's pray this prayer together, Johnny. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. That's all good up until that point. And then if I die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take? You kidding me? That'll put fear in the hearts of a little kid. They lay at wake at night. Good night. Sleep tight. Don't let the evil babe bugs bite you and take your soul. <laughs> Poor kid. Please don't pray that prayer over your kid. I mean, we've got enough fears in our life. We don't need to get our kids started with that one. Can you imagine laying awake at night going... Pray the Lord my soul to take. Wait a minute, if I die before I wake? Could you imagine what a four-year-old or a five-year-old would be playing with in their brain as when that goes on? Anyway, uh, we got enough fears that we've got to deal with, right? So today we're going to take a look at a popular uh, portion of the Bible, and it's from Luke chapter 2, verses 8 through 11. Julie just read it uh, as part of the so-and-so kids show. Here it is from Luke chapter 2. That night, there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby. By the way, I, I, I can't read this without hearing Linus's voice in my head. Remember Charlie Brown? Charlie Brown's Christmas. Linus comes out on stage. Everything goes dark and a bright light shines in him. And he reads the Christmas story. All right. Just nostalgic for a moment there. That night, there were shepherds staying in the fields nearby, guarding their flocks of sheep. And suddenly, an angel of the Lord appeared among them. And the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded them. And they were terrified, says the Bible. But the angel reassured them, don't be afraid, he said. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to all people. The Savior, yes, the Messiah, the Lord, has been born today in Bethlehem, the city of David. Now, some of you can maybe ask that question, what is the good news, right? Uh, I mean, if we needed a Savior, why would I need a Savior? And it's really interesting to me in this story that the shepherds uh, were the ones to receive the news from the angel. The The angels announce, hey, there's good news. A baby has been born. Well, why is that good news? And why did the angels come to the shepherds of all people? Now, back in the time when Jesus lived, whenever a family would uh, give birth to a child, uh, especially if they had average means or were wealthy, they would hire someone to herald or to walk up and down the street announcing that the child was born, right? Uh, Especially if they were wealthy. 
Hark the herald angels sing, right? The angel is a herald. So the angel shows up, but the message that he gives isn't to the kings of the earth. It isn't to the Pharisees and Sadducees and the teachers of the law. It wasn't even even to the Jewish ruling council or let alone the city of Bethlehem. The angel shows up in a field where there's shepherds watching over their flocks. Why would God do that? Why would he pronounce or announce the birth of the savior of the world, the good news, to a group of shepherds. And that's what God does. And think about it. The son of God being born on earth, born to, and announced to a bunch of shepherds. Well, maybe you don't think that's very odd. You know, we've got shepherds in our manger scene. There's probably a few shepherds in little toys or something around here somewhere. Uh, we're talking about shepherds. I mean, we all know that there were shepherds at the Bethlehem, but you've got to know some things about a shepherd and some of the reasons why that they were afraid. Shepherds were one of the most disrespected groups of people in the Jewish society. The job of a shepherd was, um, was to take care of the sheep. Now, if a father had five sons, or if he had three sons, or if he had 10 sons, it was always the youngest son who had to take care of the sheep. And sometimes it wasn't even the youngest son, it was a slave that took care of the sheep. Why? Because it was the lowest of the low as far as structure or jobs to take care of sheep. They were despised as people. They were often uneducated because why would a father want to expend energy and resources on the youngest son who was just taking care of sheep anyway when I have other sons who are firstborn, secondborn, who I would spend money on? Resources are are scarce. And so these shepherds were the ones that were despised. Shepherds were always rejected, even by the religious system. I can't even imagine that. Uh, Yes, but... The truth is, I can't imagine it. Shepherds were rejected by the religious system. Here's what happened, is that they would, um, shepherds could not live up to the religious rules of the day. They were out in the fields 24-7, watching over the sheep. That makes sense, right? Kind of like a long-distance truck driver. You're gone for 10 days, you come back, you see your family. Sometimes shepherds would be gone for months. But in the Jewish ruling system, if you didn't make it to the temple... You were not clean. You had not given sacrifice for your sins. And so the religious system of the day told them that they had to be away to take care of the sheep, but they couldn't be in the temple. And because they couldn't be in the temple, they were now considered spiritually unclean. As a matter of fact, if you touched a shepherd, you were considered unclean. I want you to think about Those people amongst us, people that you know who struggle with addictions, if they came out and said, I'm an addict, not I'm a recovering addict, or I've been recovered, or God has blessed me for 30 years of recovery, but they came right out and said, I'm an addict. I'm not just an alcoholic. I'm an addict. Now you start to begin to feel what it would be like to be rejected by the people in a church that are supposed to love you. That's how the shepherds felt. Just think about coming out as gay. How would parents and a church respond to that news, right? Would they be hands off? And I think that we've seen a lot of that over the years. Love unconditionally is what we're called to do. And that's how the shepherds were treated. These shepherds were, uh, they felt distant from God. They were kept away from the spiritual health of the community. They were not allowed to be uh, involved with the church. And there are three reasons that I think that the shepherds felt distant from God as well. They felt very unworthy. Now, many of us feel this way. In fact, they were outcasts in Israel, right? Right? They, uh, they were taught specifically, you are not good enough for religion. You are not good enough for God. 
The reason is that they were nomads. They were wanderers. They were away from the temple. They, they couldn't come back. They, they couldn't perform the religious duties in order to make them clean. They didn't go to church or read their Bibles or uh, attend you know, members meetings or, or whatever the modern day equivalent would be. And could you imagine hanging around with a shepherd? I mean, Julie said it here on the, on the video. I mean, these are men who would go weeks without showers, without proper toilets, hanging around with sheep. <laughs> I mean, sitting next to a shepherd probably wasn't a very pleasant experience. And so they were physically dirty, but more so that they were religiously dirty. And they felt very unworthy before God. And a lot of people can feel that way even still today, right? We kind of say things like, you know, we got to go to church and we put our church face on and we put our Christmas clothes on. Some of you didn't. I put a jacket on today. This is a come as you are church, so, you know, I guess we'll be all right with it. But if, if we looked inside and we said, you know what, man, you know, I've done some wrong things in my life. And I know the things that I should do and I didn't. And I know the things that I shouldn't do and I did them anyway. They're bad things. How could God love someone like me? And then you look around at all the perfectly managed people in the room and they look pretty and... And you say to yourself, I almost killed one of my kids this morning. <laughs> if my arm was this much longer, I would have taken him out. I remember my dad driving with one hand, swinging in the back. <laughs> you know? <laughs> and, you, and you think about this morning, and you think to yourself, where did you brush your hair? You know, no, you stand on that line. Are you serious? We have got to go worship Jesus today. It's Christmas. Shut up. This is time to get going. And now you sit here and you think to yourself, I just really screwed that up. Not too far from the truth, is it? You feel unworthy. You feel inadequate. And then you look around and you see all these people with well-dressed, managed hair, kids that look like they're all put together, and you think, I don't feel worthy. I think that they felt inadequate as shepherds. They felt inadequate. They were uneducated, and so they never really felt like they measured up in society. And I think it's amazing that we start to compare ourselves with others. This comparison game goes on and on and on, right? Facebook and Instagram, it's just one comparison after another, after another, after another. And you go to someone's house and uh, they have, you know, the house smells like scented candles and the floor is clean and the dishes are put away and their kids are all put together. And you go back home and you, you smell dirty laundry, you can't find the floor and you haven't seen a brush since 2000. We feel inadequate. We, put, we, we compare ourselves to other people all the time. And the shepherds had to have felt inadequate. One of the, one of the rules for, for being a Jew was that you were supposed to hold the Sabbath, that you were supposed to take a day off of rest. How, what would happen to the sheep if they took a day off? They worked 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They couldn't do that. They couldn't take the day off. So they felt constantly spiritually unclean. And sometimes we're like that too, right? We look around at other people. They seem so close to God. They've always got a verse from the Bible. They start quoting from this book in the Bible, and I didn't even know that that was in the Bible. And you think to yourself, I know that they pray so well and they seem to have everything put together. And the last time that I prayed, it was kind of like, God, please help me not kill that guy who took my parking spot. They felt unworthy and they felt inadequate. And I think that they felt unloved. Most of them were thieves. 
I mean, if you're that pushed out on, outside of society, and you know this, if you work in any social assistance or in any uh, uh, a field where you're dealing with people in the public, the farther that they are pushed out of society, the greater the likelihood that they're going to go to criminal behavior. Now, not all of them were thieves, but the Jewish system of religious rules, there were 613 of those rules plus the Ten Commandments, uh, were such that a shepherd was not even allowed to be called as a witness because they were untrustworthy. And a father wouldn't give his daughter to a shepherd because the name thief would then be attached to his daughter. Could you imagine feeling that unloved by your own community? That your prospects for love and for children and for a decent life were just always and forever out of your reach. Some of you are struggling with the fact that your dad left you when you were young, left you and your mom, and you had to stay together. And you ask the question, what is wrong with me? Did he not love me? And there may be some of you that are going to have Christmas this year without your spouse. We prayed about this earlier, about that loved one. But for some, that spouse looked at you and said, I don't love you anymore. And you're looking at yourself going, what did I do wrong? I tried. I honestly tried. I did the best that I could. And they feel unloved. Some of you look in the mirror and the person that looks back at you doesn't love you. And you say things like, you know what? I don't even know that I love myself anymore. And it's always so amazing to me about the differences in perception and reality. Perception on a day like this in church and, it, you know, you can look around and you can think to yourself, well, he's got it together or she's got it together or uh, they're, they're more successful than I am and they, they had a business and it didn't fail and I, my business failed. I can't provide for my kids the like they provide for their kids and there's a dad here probably worried about the fact that they can't provide enough for their children so when their kids go back to school in January that their kids are tempted to lie about what they got for Christmas. When we feel unloved, it leaves a gaping hole. There might be somebody three seats down from you who's about ready to cash it in because they just feel inadequate. I just can't do this anymore. Right in front of you, there might be a guy who lifted his hands in worship, somebody who you thought, oh, you know what, they really engaged. And deep inside, he's dealing with this inadequacy, this feeling of being unloved, that aloneness. Maybe there's somebody sitting right behind you who's single. And that single person is saying, God, what, what about me? Is there no one who will love me? I'm serving you. I'm a Christian. I'm, I'm, I'm in the church. And, and you know what? I, I'm trying to be an effective person, and yet no one seems to want me. Th these feelings that the shepherds had are not far from us. They're the same feelings that we have. And the bottom line is, is that religion, the religion of their day, did not work for the shepherds. You can feel that, right? So many people today still have those same feelings. They think about the religion of those people who hurt me. I was there in their church and they rejected me. I said that I was in need and they looked down on me. That's religion and I'm here to tell you that Jesus didn't want that kind of religion either. Religion didn't work for the shepherds, and religion doesn't work for us either. Let me say that again. Religion doesn't work for us. You might say, well, well, well wait, wait, wait a second, <laughs> Pastor. It's kind of what I thought you guys were all about, Right? Jesus did not send, or God did not send his son Jesus into the world 
to set us free so that we could be filled with rules. He came to set us free from the idea of religion itself. He said, I am a person, not a book of rules. God sent a person so that we could have a relationship with that person. You know, there were 613 commandments in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, we kind of pared them down to the 10 commandments. And then Jesus says, well, I'm going to make it even simpler. There's only two. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. And yet, even those two can become religion and not relationship. If I do the right thing, if I feel better about myself, if I don't do the wrong thing, I'll feel better about myself. I mean, I must be a good person because I don't drink, I don't smoke, I don't toke, and I don't go with people who do. A little updated on that old phrase. So I must be okay, right? I'm a good person, aren't I? All of you could say that, right? Aren't you a good person? I mean, you're not as bad as so-and-so. Maybe I'm not as good as that person, but I'm generally a good person. That's the fallacy that our world thinks about religion. They think that they're all that this life entails is to be a good person. And that's so far from the truth. God doesn't want us to compare ourselves to other people other people here or other people in your life. He doesn't want us to compare ourselves and how we're doing based upon how they're doing or how they're not doing it. He's saying, don't forget the comparison about loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and loving your neighbor as yourself is a comparison to God himself. I heard somebody say this week, or maybe it was last week, I'm not sure. Think about a boat that's sinking. If all of humanity was on a boat that's sinking and God sent a rescue boat, but you chose not to get in the boat, whose fault is that? There was enough room for everyone, but some people choose not to get in the boat. Religion didn't work for the shepherds, and it doesn't work for us because Christianity was never meant to be a religion. It was meant to be a relationship with God. That's why God sent a person. That's why God sent Jesus. Okay, so if that's the good news, the good news that God sent the Savior to the world, that the angels are standing before the shepherds who were terrified, not only just because an angel showed up, but because they were the dregs of society, that we maybe can identify with the shepherds' fears of being unwanted and unworthy and unloved. What is the good news? At Christmas time, we can't just be focused on the Christmas tree and the presents, but we have to understand the person that Jesus was. And so from Romans chapter 3, this is probably the most succinct message of the gospel, and it comes from a guy who hated Christians at the beginning of his life. He, cru- he persecuted them. He put them in jail. He went from town to town trying to find them and put them away. And then he had an encounter with God, and he says something like this, for no one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. The law simply shows us how sinful we are. But now God has shown us a way to be made right with him without keeping the requirements of the law as was promised in the writings of Moses and the prophets long ago. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. So what does this mean? Let me break it down for you. You cannot earn God's acceptance by observing the law. You can't be good enough. You can't do all the things that you're supposed to. You can't be better than the next person beside you in order to receive God's acceptance. You don't need to be better than everyone else. The shepherds physically could not do it. And yet the angel says, I've got good news for you guys. Good news. There's a baby in Bethlehem and he was just born. And he's God's son, a person, not a book of rules. 
For no one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. I can't do enough. Because I'm being compared with God, not everyone else in the room. And number two, what's the purpose of the law? Number two, to show you that you need a savior. Look at this verse 20 again. For no one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. Why is the law there? The law simply shows us how sinful we are. I need to say this once more because I think that you need to hear it again. And I think that we need to kind of have this kind of in our thought process when we have conversations with people. Because in our culture today, one of the fundamental flaws in its thinking is that so many people believe that they're actually good. Like, if I was to sit two of you down together and say, which one's more gooder? <laughs> we, we could probably come up with a list of things that want, I do better or you do better. And probably in your ho- own head, you think that you're better than you really are. All right? Maybe some of you don't. I don't know. But we're not talking about comparing ourselves to other people, remember. We're com- talking about comparing ourselves to God. Now, I've done this before in a sermon years ago, and I'm going to do this again because there's a lot of new people here. So I want you to do this. This is audience participation time, and some of you are rolling your eyes at me. Okay, I get it. But you're all going to participate, okay? Put your hand up if you've ever told a lie. Okay. All right, now take the other, hold, keep your hands up, keep your hands up. Now point your finger at the person who's not got their hand up and say, liar, liar, pants on fire. (laughs) Isn't it fun to do that in church? Yeah, liar, liar, pants on fire. How many of you have ever stolen? Hands up, come on. Every one of you should be having your hands in the air. <laughs> Some of you probably stole it. Maybe just a little thing. Now, this is where it, participation ends, okay? So you don't have to put your hand up for this next one. Because this is kind of a serious one. Jesus said, even if you think lustful thoughts about someone, you commit adultery. How many of you have thought lustful thoughts? Yeah. So, what do you call someone who lies? A liar. What do you call someone who steals? Stealer? No. (laughs) A thief, yes. A liar, a thief. What do you call someone who thinks lustful thoughts, according to Jesus? An adulterer. All right? So, we've got a whole church full of liars, stealers, and adulterers. That should put it all into perspective, right? For no one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. The law simply shows us how sinful we are. And when you realize that you need a savior, you're going to recognize this, that religion cannot save you. It's not the rules. It's not the organization's ideas or vision or membership in the church. None of that is going to save you. It is about a relationship that you have with Jesus Christ. He came 2,000 years ago as a baby in a manger, and they announced it to the shepherds of all people who could understand this concept so powerfully. The unwanted, the unloved. Those are the people that God calls to this good news. And I imagine that every single one of you has felt that way before. We're looking for salvation from a person. I think the third thing in this passage is that righteousness with God comes by faith in Jesus. Let's go to the next verse. But now God has shown us a way to be made right with him. Verse 21. That's me, for some reason. Verse 21. Now, but now God has shown us a way to be made right with him without keeping the requirements of the law, as was promised in the writings of Moses and the prophets long ago. The next verse. 
For we are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who you are. Is that an amen statement or not? How are you made right with God? Say it again with me. And this is true for everyone who believes. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. No matter who we are. I got that all mixed up. I wanted you to say it with me, but that didn't work. Are you good enough on your own? No. Because of what Jesus, God's son, did for us on the cross. Becoming sin for us. That's why the cross and the Christmas tree can be in the same space. When we think about Christmas and the baby Jesus. Religion didn't work for the shepherds. But a relationship did. See, because of the cross, God no longer sees our sin. He doesn't see the fact that we're dirty or smelly. He doesn't see the fact that we haven't been in church for a while. He doesn't see the fact that we have not been able to follow all the rules. What does God see? God sees your relationship with Jesus. Do you have one? Is your relationship one that you live out because you understand the depth of this powerful notion? Fear not, says the angel, for today in the town of David, a savior has been born for you. That's the great news. The savior, the Messiah, the one who comes to save us from all our sins. That's the good news. No matter who you are, a savior has been born and his name is Jesus Christ. Let me pray for you. Father, we thank you for the message that you gave to the shepherds the outcasts, the dirty, the smelly, the ones on the margins. And Lord, there's, there's just no one here who can't identify with at least part of their story. That we've all felt some of what they felt. Thank you, Jesus, for being there for us. That you came for us to love us, no matter who we are. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.